everyone. Whether you're in person or joining virtually, we hope you had a time to take a snack break or a lunch break and meet new Figma friends or catch up with old ones. My name is Deepa. I'm a software engineer on the community team here at Figma, and today I'm going to be your host for the next hour. If you need your help, um, if you're here in person and you need help finding your way around the conference, just reach out to anyone wearing one of those blue tees. We literally have hundreds of Figma employees who have flown in from all across the country to make this experience as exceptional for you as possible. And if you're joining us on virtual, there are Figmates in the chat, so say hello and reach out if you need anything. OK, cool. And now what all of you are really here for. So getting back into it, up next, we have Andrea Morgan, Jack, and Ryan from the Ford Mortar Company sharing how they built and evolved their design system assets to support multiple brands and platforms. They'll talk about some of the benefits and challenges their teams have experienced and how they've been starting to reduce the complexity of their design system structure with variables in Figma. So welcome the Ford team to the stage. Thank you so much, and welcome, everyone. Good afternoon, and for those of you on virtual, good morning and good evening. Thank you for joining us today as we walk through our journey in creating a multi-channel, multi-theme, connected libraries within Figma. My name is Andrea Morgan Mathewson, and I'm the design system lead at Ford Motor Company. And today I have with me Ryan, our mobile design system lead, and Jack, our vehicle design system lead. We can advance the slide, please. Thank you. Today, we're going to give you an overview of our platforms and products that our design system accommodates today. We're going to do a deep dive into our current design system structure, and we're going to show you what we've been able to accomplish with variables so far. Round of applause for variables, please. And a sneak peek into what we hope we can accomplish in the future. If you can advance the slide, thank you. Our design system accommodates both Ford and Lincoln brands across several platforms. We built this to include not only web, wearables, and mobile applications, but also the digital screens inside the vehicle, such as controller and driver information. The last two platforms are especially unique as they aren't as standardized as the others. With a wide array of platform-specific requirements and development considerations, such as text size, pixel density, even viewing distance, we need a system that's flexible enough to accommodate them all. Our current design system structure features a core foundations team in Figma. That feeds into each platform's unique component libraries. So let's go ahead and open this up a little bit. Foundations is comprised of all core artifacts used across all of our platforms. First up, we have four parallel brand and theme specific foundation libraries, which house all of our color styles. Next, we have iconography and image asset libraries, which helps us ensure consistency across all of our platforms. And last but not least, we have our design system guidelines. It's our owner's manual. This is one piece I'm really proud of. We've been able to contain all of our documentation in one place. We house all of our information for things like components, patterns, usage, development resources, and much more. We start at a high level from like, what is a button, all the way down to the nuts and bolts. Like, what's the padding between the button text and its components across all platforms? Excuse me, button text and its container across all platforms. We're going to go the next layer deeper. Each platform has its own team within Figma. These teams contain all libraries specific to that platform. First, we have our typography and grids. These feed into their component libraries while staying agnostic of theme. Next, these libraries com combined with our foundations are pulled into base component libraries, which house all of our platform's components in their simplest form. Using instances of base components, we've created libraries of brand and theme specific components. 
These libraries are held together by our base components. They share an identical structure, but they differ in visual styling to meet the needs of the brand and theme. We found that with a flexible platform agnostic foundations, new platforms can easily adopt our design system structure and create components and products that share the same core visual DNA. We even built our own custom Figma plugin. You can swap all of these libraries by selection, page, or document. And because all libraries are structured identically, the plugin can seamlessly swap across brand, platform, and theme. As you'll see here, the plugin is taking this in vehicle screen, swapping its foundation, component, and typography libraries from one theme to the next in a single click. And just for a quick, a quick legal disclaimer, all screens that you're going to see today, they are for demonstration purposes only. They are not production intent. So let's take one step back and revisit our system structure. We've built this deep network of interchangeable connected libraries. Our system's running like a well-oiled machine. You might say an F-150. <laughs> our designers are successfully using libraries to build and deliver product, products. Job well done, right? We know our library structure works. We've achieved structural parity by leveraging our base components and parallel foundation libraries. We've also taken extra care in making sure that our system's easy to use, things like nested properties and clear naming conventions. And as I showed earlier, we've achieved seamless multi-library swapping through our custom plugin. And looking at this structure, it's, it's no secret we can connect libraries within libraries within libraries all day long. You guys get it. However, due to the foundations and base component nature driven of our component libraries, there are a few drawbacks. First, we find ourselves still maintaining each brand and theme libraries somewhat individually when a change cannot be accommodated by our base component, such as our button corner radius as you see here. Using a base component driven system structure adds depth to our component anatomy and adds some complexity. Here's an example of our button anatomy and our button anatomy and we're going to go into detail about this a little bit later on. And though we are really proud of our custom plugin, it doesn't perfectly convert across screens across multiple platforms without some manual rework by our designers. So as you can see here, the plugin has converted the screen's content from our controller to mobile components, but the screen size differs, and it does require manual update. And I saw some of your faces earlier when I showed this, so I know we all can agree this is a lot of libraries. And we're designers, not librarians, right? And you want to talk about stress? Educating our teams on our structure of our systems looks a little something like this Charlie moment about Pepe Silvia from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. There's a plug-in on Figma for this, so I'm, I feel like everyone knows this one. Um, anyway, now I'm going to pass to Jack, our vehicle lead, and he's going to drive you on the next part of our journey, variables. Thanks so much, Andrea Morgan, and good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Jack Minogue, and I'm the in-vehicle uh, lead product designer for in-vehicle design systems. Um, today, I'd like to talk to you guys about the exciting new feature that we all heard about yesterday, variables. Now, we got beta access to variables about a month ago, and it became very obvious that they would be incredibly powerful for our design systems. So today, I'd like to talk to you guys about how we've leveraged variables thus far and where we plan on heading with them. And going back to our library structure, I'll show you how we're going from this to this. So far, we've leveraged color variables to replace existing color styles within our library. We've used number variables to control size and shape across brand, theme, and platform. And lastly, we've used string variables to change the way that we are building our components for cross-platform compatibility. So let's start by talking about color. Before, our colors were organized into separate yet parallel foundation libraries. So here, we're looking at our wireframe, Ford Dark, Ford Light, and Lincoln foundation libraries. 
Because these libraries are parallel in structure, we could easily change the foundation library that our components were pulling from. So this allowed us to change the brand and theme of our components in a matter of seconds. And to dive a bit deeper into how we organize our colors, we use modular semantic naming conventions to make sure that our colors are understandable and scalable. We found that primitive naming was not easily understandable to our designers, and that by baking an identity and usage into our color naming convention, it helped alleviate that issue. So our color naming convention is broken into five layers of organization. Starting with application. So what type of element is the style being applied to? Next is theme behavior. So does the color invert between dark and light themes, or does it stay persistent? After that, we have category. So what type of color is it? What type of information is it meaning to convey? Next is placement. So does the element sit directly on a surface or on a different type of background fill? And last, we have emphasis level. So what level of emphasis does the element have? Now, personally, I've attended a lot of talks in the past day or so at Config about naming conventions and the importance of them and a lot of really great strategies on how to iron one out. Um, I just wanted to say that you know this is just what works for us, and there's really no best way to organize a color table. Um, this is just what works for us. And other design system teams out there are probably going to find that they may need simpler or more comprehensive organizations of their colors. Now, let's take one more look back at our current color table. These names are essentially alias tokens that are attributed to a specific usage within our design system. But we can't ignore the fact that there are a lot of duplicates across this table. Many of our colors are using the exact same hex, hex values across multiple categories, and this is very much intentional. We separate our color styles by category to afford us the ability to compartmentalize their usage across brand and theme. The issue here is that we did not yet have a first party solution for connecting these duplicate colors using a core set of tokens. So long before we even touched variables, we had already been preparing by tokenizing our colors. We started by gathering every color across all brands and themes. And while it's really nice looking at all these color ramps neatly organized onto a table, we needed a way to name them and to do so in a way that allowed for scalability. So in order to do that, we came up with an algorithm, or formula rather, uh, based on the color's contrast ratio against pure black. This formula gives us a range from 0 to 1,000 to work within, 0 being pure black, 1,000 being pure white. And this method has proven to be more than enough to accommodate our current colors, while also affording us the scalability to grow and scale the, our, our color palettes over time. Now, I know what you're probably all thinking looking at this. Designers doing actual math? Well, let's not get ridiculous. Of course we had ChatGPT do all the math for us. <laughs> so let's take our primary blue, for example. It has a contrast ratio of 8.24 to 1 against pure black. If I take that 8.24 and put it into our equation here, ChatGPT tells me that we get 362 as the result. So that number, combined with the color's primitive name, becomes this color's unique numeric identifier. When we have multiple opacities of the same color, we add an alpha identifier to the end of the token name. So thanks to a bit of AI automated seventh grade algebra, we now have all of our colors organized neatly into core tokens. Now we're ready for variables. These core tokens became core variables in our design system. We organized all of them into a collection in a library that is owned and maintained by the design systems team, not visible to consuming designers. From there, we went back into our existing foundation libraries and nested core variables into alias variables that had the exact same naming conventions as our color styles. We created unique modes for wireframe, Ford Light, Ford Dark, and Lincoln, and again, nested core color variables from that library that had our core tokens in it. Now, spoiler alert, we're going to do some more nesting, so please try and bear with me. We went into our color styles in our foundation library and essentially backed up each color style with one of our alias variables that we had created. 
So if I go into the color style editor here, you can see that I can attribute one or more variables to a color style. So what has this done for us so far? With our color styles backed up by variables, I can now drag these color palettes across different frames within Figma with different modes assigned to them and instantly change the colors And I don't know about you guys, but the first time I saw this working, which for many of you was yesterday morning, I about fell out of my chair. So what has this done for our system structure so far? Well, now that we have all of our color variables being controlled in a singular library, we don't need four foundation libraries anymore. So we consolidated them into one. But wait, what about all these component libraries? Well, let's take a look at what variables have done with our components thus far. So just to recap, I've nested core color variables into alias color variables. I then backed up my color styles using those alias variables. I pushed that color style update out to my component libraries that are being used by our design system teams today, or our design teams today. So now, much like with the color palettes on that previous slide, we can now drag entire components across different frames within Figma with different modes assigned to them and instantly change the theme of our components. Really cool. But we, of course, found ourselves at a point where we needed to control far more than just color across the Ford and Lincoln brands. So how do we get there? Well, let's first back up and talk about base components. So like we mentioned earlier, our entire design system is rooted in the use of base components a now somewhat common practice in maintaining a multi-theme design system. I'm sure many of you out here today are very familiar with the concept of base components if you're not already using them in your design systems today. But as a brief recap, branded components are built using instances of base components. These instances can be styled freely while preserving the core structure of the base component. And structural changes to the base component cascade down to the branded libraries, so on and so forth. But the question is, what is the cost of this approach? Here's what our branded components end up looking like below the surface. So you can see that a component as simple as a button required a ton of nesting and a ton of layers using a base component structure. Even our icons require special treatment in order to perfectly preserve color overrides when switching brand and theme. So because our 1400 plus icon library is housed externally from our components, we found that color overrides were not always preserved when swapping between themes. So instead, we have icon wrapper components within our component libraries that use the icon's vector path as a mask for an underlying fill layer. So this approach gave us a little more granular control over not only the size of our icons within our component libraries, but also ensured that color overrides were preserved every time we swapped between brand and theme. But this, of course, added quite a bit of complexity to, again, a component as simple as an icon, and also added a bit of complexity to the consumption of these components by our product, or by our product design teams. In addition to that, any product designer at Ford designing for any given platform has to enable a pretty extensive list of libraries to get access to everything that they needed. So let's go back to our very lengthy design system structure here. At this point, we've implemented color variables. We've been able to lighten up our library structure quite a bit at the foundations level. But we did not yet have a way of fully getting away from base components. So now, I'd like to hand it over to Ryan to talk about how we've used number and string variables to take this a step further. Thank you, Jack. Now I'm going to take us back into our core variables library, where I'm going to talk about core number variables. We started by creating a collection of number variables that are some of our most common values we use for things like layout, spacing, and corner radius. And it's all based off of our soft date grid. And core numbers, just like core colors, should only be used by the design system team. Then, moving into our foundations library, we created another collection containing device and screen size specific number variables. We use raw numbers for the display dimensions and certain platform specific margins and padding, and nested core number variables into the rest. But what are all these numbers actually doing, right? Let me show you. 
Let's take a look at how we applied number variables to this mobile screen. First, we created system UI components that are preloaded with global elements, like our header, navigation, things like that. Each platform system UI component is connected to device and platform strings, which we'll get into in a little bit. These components are fixed within the frame and connected to the screen height and width number variables that we created in our screen size collection. We then created an auto layout frame to house our screen content. We use device-specific number variables to create the inset padding and margins. And inside of that auto layout, we use our spacing number variables to control the vertical spacing between content. Now let's take a look at this in context. By assigning unique number variables to each screen size mode, we can now control screen content layouts across different screen sizes and their device frames. Pretty cool, right? We can quickly swap between desktop, watch OS, Android, iOS, and a bunch of others. Now that we've looked at how we can control our screen dimensions and padding with number variables, let's take a look at how this applies to our components. We assign number variables to dimension properties on our components, like the corner radius on this button. Because that corner radius is being controlled by brand-specific variable modes, that same button component for both Ford and Lincoln can have a different corner radius as you move it across different modes. So going back to our system structure, by just implementing color and number variables, we have the ability to take all of these component libraries shown here and consolidate them into a single library per platform. But we didn't stop there. We also started experimenting with string variables to pressure test our unified component library approach. Using a very simple string variable in our foundation library, we created modes for each of our platforms. We also created a string variable in our screen size collection. This gives us a more granular approach over device-specific components. So for example, we have multiple device types within our mobile platform, and we use screen size strings to allow for differentiation between, say, an iOS versus Android header within the same mobile platform. Now let's lift up the hood and dive into how we apply strings to our components. We constructed our new button by creating platform-specific subcomponents. Notice how these buttons have varying number of states across each platform. This made it so we couldn't just use number variables to capture these differences. Each platform's button subcomponent then gets nested into a single parent button component. Next, we create platform variant properties and name each variant identical to its string variable. So now, when I bring this button component into my file, I can assign the platform string variable to the component's platform variant property, allowing that instance to be controlled by the platform modes. Applying that same string variable to several components, we can now change platform, as well as branded theme, faster than a Mach-E GT going 0 to 60. That's 3.8 seconds, by the way. <laughs> so combining our application of string variables with number and color variables, we're now able to instantly convert entire screens from one platform, brand, theme, to another. Thank you. Variables are so powerful, and we are freaking out about them. <laughs> so you can see here that by selecting different modes in my branded theme, screen size, and platform collections, my frame size, layout, colors, and components are all converting effortlessly and instantly. Bringing us from our component libraries being housed within the platform-specific teams to all platforms worth of components being housed within a singular library at the foundation's team level. And we've renamed this library Design Resources so that it's inclusive of styles and components. But what comes next, right? We're very excited about this approach. And now we have a working proof of concept leveraging variables to convert experiences to any of our platforms. But there's still plenty to do. We still plan on diving deeper into nesting variables, ironing out the usability of variables for consuming designers, making sure that applying modes 
in designs is a simple and straightforward process. Further exploration around Boolean variables, which we haven't even scratched the surface on yet. We also need to think through how variables can more efficiently fuel our translations and right-to-left conversion processes. And then some of our accessibility considerations, like high contrast and dynamic type. That's just a list of few things. And currently, typography still remains housed at the platform-specific libraries, since it's not yet supported. But we are very excited with the release of Variables v2, which will include typography variables. In the meantime, we're preparing for typography variables by leveraging platform-agnostic semantic naming conventions for our textiles, just as we did with our colors. Our naming convention is broken into three levels of organization. Starting with category, we ask, what is the text hierarchy? Title, body, caption, etc. those kind of things. Then we go size. We use the same t-shirt scaling as our color emphasis levels to ensure that our type system is scalable. And lastly, usage. We've intentionally excluded font weight from our naming convention in the event that one brand opts for a bold primary title while the other one goes for a thin weight. This ensures that we have a one-to-one -one mapping of textiles across brand, theme, and platform based on frequency of usage. Now, diving a little bit deeper into usage, we call the most commonly used weight primary. Alternate weights and styles are sequenced numerically, Alt-1, Alt-2, etc. And decorated texts, such as underlines and strikethroughs, those are named semantically, as those treatments remain consistent across brand and platform. For now, we'll continue using our plugin to supplement the mode swapping we're afforded with variables by having it swap typography libraries across brand and platform. So after we switch to modes, we can then run our custom plugin to swap any remaining unchanged textiles to the correct platform styles. But when typography variables are released, we'll phase out the plugin and migrate our textiles from their platform-specific libraries into our design resources as well. And lastly, when grid layouts become supported by variables, we'll migrate our grid layouts from their platform-specific libraries, if you haven't noticed, into our design resources as well. This leaves us with a singular foundations team that accommodates all brands, themes, platforms, and devices, taking us from a library of libraries to a single Ford design system. Now I'd like to hand it back to Andrew Morgan to talk through impact and takeaways. Thank you. Excellent, guys. Thank you so much, Ryan. And whoo, that was a lot of work. Great job, guys. But we aren't done yet. Now let's take a look at the impact variables has had on our design system other than just consolidating the library structure. By consolidating our design system into a single library, it has numerous benefits. It allows for consistent experience across platforms, streamlined creation process, as well as facilitates a faster dev handoff and simplifies our testing efforts across multiple devices. By embracing this approach, we can improve collaboration and deliver a seamless user experience. When creating a seamless user experience, all platforms must be considered. And yes, we do have multiple experiences that do span across all of these platforms. A few examples are profile, charging your electric vehicle, even climate control. By consolidating the design system into a single library, it ensures a consistent experience across all platforms. Users will have a unified interaction and visual design regardless of the platform they're using. And our consuming designers will be able to design experiences across multiple touch points with ease. Here's just an example of what a profile page may look like across our platforms, starting with our smallest screen, wearables, all the way to one of our larger in-vehicle controller screens. By centralizing our design resources in a single library, the creation process becomes much easier and more efficient. Designers can locate all necessary components, styles, assets in one place, eliminating the need to search across multiple libraries. Here's an example again of our mobile libraries now. Now imagine if you had a design across multiple platforms, you're going to multiply that times five. I think we all can agree one library is much easier to search through. Also, designers can leverage our single library to quickly generate all handoff assets. 
Here's an example of what an in-vehicle designer could hand off. It's the same screen, but different screen sizes and also unique system UIs. Multiple design libraries can often result in redundancy and duplication of assets. Consolidating into a single library helps eliminate that unnecessary duplication. It helps us streamline our workflows, reduces the risk of inconsistencies, or even conflicting design patterns. So taking a look back at our anatomy button component, I think we all agree that's a lot, right? By removing base components and allowing color and numeric values to be controlled by variables, we go from this to this, which is a much, much simpler button anatomy. So just a quick recap of our talk today. Variables are your powerful new best friend, so don't be afraid of them. We want to leave you guys with a few key takeaways that we've, that we've learned along the way. Number one, keep your color naming conventions super organized and clean. This is going to save you a ton of time when you go to implement your color variables. Make sure to connect variables to your existing color styles and publish them to any connected component libraries that you have today. This is going to automatically create that connection between your variables and your components in your design system. So you can start using them almost instantly. Keep your variable collections separated by unique sets of modes. Be mindful of the variables that are and are not mutually exclusive. Make sure you're creating those breakpoints at the collection level as needed. But also, try to limit the number of collections in your library. Each collection with multiple modes will become a dropdown in your layer panel. And it's important to ensure that selecting the correct mode is quick and straightforward process for your team's product designers. We have brand and theme, screen size, and platform as seen here. And lastly, be sure to leverage nested variables to create stronger connections and easier maintenance. We'll be doing a lot more of this in the future, but so far we found that nesting color and number variables from our core library has been an insanely powerful addition to our, our system management. This approach becomes especially powerful when we create multiple layers of nesting into alias and component-specific variables. Now, we've hoped you've learned a lot today about how we began to leverage variables to fuel our multi-channel, multi-theme connected design system. And now it's your turn to go discover how variables can push your design systems forward. And again, thank you so much for uh, attending our talk. And also just a big shout out to the Figma team. We could not have done this without Chad, Jacob, Alyssa, and Jacqueline. Thank you guys and enjoy the rest of Config.